We're in a series right now called um, The Ten Healthy Missional Markers of the Church. It's not the best title I could think of, but uh, it's kind of long. You know, it's not catchy and clever. But what it is, is very important. Because I believe health is very, very important. I believe that our, uh, our ability to walk in a healthy way is an important thing to do as believers, but also as a church. My goal for us as a church is to become more and more healthy, for us to live in a healthy way so that we become actually something significant in town, not because of the significance of it, but because it's making an impact. It's making a difference in the lives of people who need to hear about Jesus. Do you know that there are still people who haven't heard about God's love for them? Do you know that? And so today we're talking about some healthy missional markers. We're going to go through the couple we talked about last week, the two, and then I'm going to hit you with two more today. Um, you can fill in the blanks as we go along. There's some places on your... Well, if you know somebody who is staying away from the church for certain reasons, you, you probably know some of these reasons. Somebody has stayed away from the church because they've been hurt by a religious person. Maybe they're staying away from the church because they've been hurt by a religious situation or something that they heard on the news or the radio about how Christians behave, so they stay away from the church organization. Or maybe some Christians stay away from the church because uh, bad things have uh, come with the church, like all of the rules and all the status and all of the, everything that sort of the organization includes, and so people kind of keep their distance. One of the main things that I hear in culture a lot are uh, these three words. Tell me if you haven't heard these words before. Don't judge me. Doesn't the culture say, don't judge me? Just love me. If you love God and you're supposed to love, God loves you, well then just love me for who I am and don't judge me. Interesting, huh? And as a Christian, as a pastor, as a person, I'm supposed to uh, love people, but I'm also supposed to point them toward God so that God can do the work in their life and God can transform them the way he wants to. I've got friends that are gay. I've got friends that are in gay relationships. I've got friends that are coming out of a lifestyle. I've got friends that are, I've got all kinds of friends and a lot of them don't like the way the culture pushes uh, or, or the Christian world pushes against them and tells them all the rules. I'm not here to tell you what's right and wrong. I know what's right and wrong in Scripture. I believe what, what God says is true and accurate. But God is the one who works on transforming people. Amen? Yeah. And if I'm the one that is pointing fingers and judging and pushing people away, then of course they're not going to come to a relationship with God because I've gotten in the way. And God wants me to be healthy. God wants us to be a healthy church and have these missional healthy markers so that we might help people see the grace that God offers. I know that I could dig myself into a pretty deep trench right now and go pretty far with a lot of issues. We could talk about a lot of things. But really what I want to talk about are some of these healthy markers that will help us get to a place of where God might want us to be as a church. Quick little story. Um, my wife and I like to watch all kinds of these reality TV shows at home. And we saw this one that's this extreme weight loss show where this guy, I think he's Canadian, he's married and he's this fitness guru. And uh, he will call on a person. People apply all the time. And this one person applied and then he will show up at their workplace or at their house or out on the baseball field or wherever they're playing. And he will in include them or invite them to be with him for a year. And they give a year of their life to eating right, living right, uh, uh, losing weight, exercising, and all this. And then at the end of the year, they do this big reveal show on how much the person lost weight. It's a pretty fantastic show. I love it because it gets super kind of emotional and it gets super spiritual. Like people know that their weight issue really isn't about the weight. It's about some other issue in their life. And for me as a pastor and a sociologist and one who likes to study psychology, I like to watch how a person finds out what really is the painful thing in their life, and it gets them to find healing in the rest of their life. Okay, so quick story we're watching this week, and this woman um, is almost 300 pounds, 295 pounds, and so this person, I forget his name, he takes her into the gym, and he says, listen, I want you to pick up this weight bar, which is a bench press weight bar, which I think is 45 pounds with no weight plates on it. And so she picks it up and he goes, I want you to hold it above your head as long as you can. So she's holding it above her head. 45 pounds is, is kind of hard to hold at full extension for quite a, kind of a long time. She's holding it for about a minute. 
She starts to get shaky, you know. She's holding it for, two, for like a minute and a half, two minutes. She's starting to like, her arms are coming down like this, you know what I mean? And the host, he starts to ask her how many things she's holding up in her life. You know, your marriage, your three kids that you parent kind of alone because your husband works so much, uh, your two jobs you're trying to hold down, the extra schooling you're trying to take. Oh yeah, and you're trying to eat right, and you're trying to exercise, and how many things are you gonna hold up? And she's like, they do a close-up on her, she's holding this bar, and it's slowly coming down and coming down. Finally, she starts crying, and she can't hold the bar anymore, and he's like, come on, hold it up, you gotta hold your life together, you know? And he's kind of barking at her, and she finally drops the bar, and goes down to her knees and starts crying. And the host, he says to her, listen, there's a time in your life where you do everything for everybody else and you forget to take care of yourself. And I love that picture because I think all of us need to take care of ourself first. We need to take care of our spiritual health first, our relationship health first, our family health. But it, it starts internally, right? And that's the first two marks of uh, the 10 missional healthy markers the first one was, if you remember last week, the centrality of the Word of God. It's written on your notes there. God's Word must be central in our life, and it is, uh, it's pivotal to absolutely everything else. If you don't ground your life on the Word of God, then really you can't have any direction or you don't have a foundation on anything if you're going to walk as a healthy believer. And number two was a life-transforming walk with Jesus. We talked about what life transformation means. It means humbly submitting to Jesus. It means listening to him, obeying what he says, when he says, how the spirit works with you. And our life begins to transform. But I believe as a healthy Christian person, as a healthy church, we need to move from only focusing on ourselves to what? Focusing on other people as well. Once we get healthy, once we get to the place where we can walk with God, we need to focus on a couple other things. You know, uh, I remember studying scripture in seminary, and we had some people who said, I'd rather just be a hermit in the mountains with God. We were studying the monks, and we were studying all this, when people would just go away and sit in a room for hours and hours and just sit with the scripture, and sometimes that looks pretty appealing, right? You want to get away from some things in life? Uh, and I can understand the introverts in the room. Some of you are probably like, that would be heaven, man. I don't want to talk to anybody for the rest of my life. I just want to sit with God. But do you know that God has called us to a ministry of people? Whether you're an introvert or an extrovert, whether you're good at speaking in public or whether you hate it and you'd rather jump off a building or, you know, whatever. God has called us to a ministry with people and other people are involved. In fact, I think Jesus said once, if I'm not mistaken, he says, uh, don't hide your light under a bushel. Remember that little children's song? It's actually scripture. Don't hide your light away from people, but you are a light on a hill. You are a city on a hill. In fact, he talked about salt. I wish I had a salt shaker with me. You can all picture a salt shaker. You know how when you have a, a corn on the cob, you know, are you barbecuing yet? Are you barbecuing at home? You ever barbecue corn on the cob? It's pretty flavor. It's kind of interesting. Put a little bit of salt. Some of you are getting that little salt flavor in your cheeks right now. And you take a bite and you're, oh. Some of you are heart patients. You've been in the, the medical, uh, you've been uh, seeing for medical issues of like too much salt in your life. Um, Scott, Jesus said, when you have too much salt, it can actually be bad for you. Jesus, I, I can picture the salt shaker top falling off and all of the salt pouring onto your uh, corn. When I was seven years old, I lived in Alaska. My dad's a missionary pilot. And I remember that my parents went away for a dinner date and this neighbor came over and watched us, me, my two brothers and my sister. And we had this family dinner with the neighbors who were, they cooked spaghetti, they made spaghetti and we had salad. I don't know why I'm telling you this, but uh, I was pouring my salad dressing on my salad and my brother said something. So I turned to talk to him and I ended up pouring ranch dressing all over my spaghetti. And the host guy, I think his name was Ken, he says, you have to eat the spaghetti. And he made me eat it. And it was like full of ranch dressing and then it was, full, oh, it was awful. I guess I can't forget it. I need to go to rehab or something. But um, when you are too salty, in other words, when you do too much, it can become kind of gruesome, kind of gross, kind of not healthy, right? We're going to talk about something 
Well, we're going to talk about something that I think is important for us. Number three is this, if you want to fill this in on your 10 missional markers, number three is intentional evangelism. Intentional evangelism. You know, the word evangelism has kind of gotten a bad rap in the last decade, don't you think? I mean, since the days of Billy Graham, Billy Graham has done incredible evangelism. He goes to a, a concert venue, he goes to this huge stadium, and he invites 100,000 people, and he'll tell them beforehand, uh, before he gives a sermon, I'm going to ask you to make a difference with God or make a change in your life, and then he'll present this very simple gospel, and then he'll invite people, and thousands of people will come forward. Those were the good old days. I think the word evangelism has been beat up and beat up and beat up. And talk about misconceptions. I think Christians who try to share their faith get into this place where we're caught into people who say, don't judge me. Don't tell me that that's the only way to heaven. And, and we get into this sort of fight, right? Have you ever noticed the word evangelism? Can you see it on the screen? Do you see what the middle word is in the word evangelism? Angel. angel that's correct. The word angel is a messenger of God. Do you know that the Greek word evangelize, evangelize or um, euangelion is really the Greek word? That actually just means good news. So an angel would come and appear to humans in, in uh, the Bible, and it would bring them good news. Do you remember the reaction that most people would have to angels? Fear. Because this giant light person would be talking to them and they'd be afraid. And the angel would first of all say, do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy. I bring you news from God. Do you know what the problem is with most Christians today? Is we don't say, do not be afraid. We come in and we bring our judgment on people. We say, you know, you shouldn't do that. Do you know that if you drink too many of those, that's not what God wants? You know, if you smoke too much of that, that's not what God wants. And we come in with a finger and start telling people how to behave rather than bringing in the good news of what God has for, us, for other people, right? We come in and we say, you're wrong instead of don't be afraid. Isn't that interesting? So I think evangelism gets this bad rap. Maybe you're a person who sort of feels like uh, you're kind of on either spectrum of this evangelism thing. Some of you could be the kind of person who's like, a, um, I don't know, you're always closing the deal. You're always telling people that they need Jesus. Absolutely every conversation is about Jesus. And if you die without God, you'll go to hell. And you're very, very, very direct. Some of you may be like that. Some of you uh, could be on the other spectrum where you're like, you know what, I'm never going to talk about it. I don't want to offend anybody. I don't want to hurt any feelings. I'm never going to bring up Jesus in my life. Somewhere, God wants us to meet in the middle, don't you think? I have a couple hard questions for you. You may not like these. But what if the disciples actually said to Jesus, uh, we don't want to do that evangelism thing. It wouldn't work for us. What if they didn't do that? What if the Apostle Paul said, you know what, I'll ride around to all these different towns, but I'm not going to share Jesus. I am not going to evangelize or share anything. What would happen? We wouldn't have our scripture. We wouldn't have churches today. Here's a harder question. What if the person that maybe shared Jesus with you and led you to Christ? What if they would have said, I don't want to share God with anybody. I'm not going to really share Jesus with this person. Maybe you sitting here wouldn't have ever heard about it. Maybe you would have just pushed away. You know, there's a cultural phenomenon in our society today. I call it homo sapiens of faith. They're kind of being extinct. People are losing faith. And I think part of it is we have parents who are raising their kids and allowing their kid to make their own faith decision rather than kind of pressuring their kid to come to church or bringing their kid to a place of faith. And do you know what I mean? We live in a tolerant society that says, I'll just raise my kid however they want to be raised. And if they want to go Buddhist, that's fine. If they want to go this, that's fine. If they want to study Hare Krishna, that's okay. If they think religion, whatever, religion isn't for me. Do you know why? We have a few generations of people that have been hurt by the church. And so therefore, they don't want to pressure their kid to be raised a certain way. Isn't that interesting in our culture? So more and more and more, we're losing people that have had kind of faith in their lives. Now, I think it's interesting. You're all here, and if you have kids that you brought here with you, uh, you're actually being intentional about faith. 
you're coming to hear about a faith that God has for you. What I want to do is tell you about uh, what's called the Great Commission. Have you heard of this? It's God's call for us to work with Him. The word co Mission means, co means alongside or partner with, and mission is God's purposes in the world. So Jesus gave what's called a great co-mission, a great way to pull us into what God is doing. And it's Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. And if you've been around the church at all for even six months or a year, you have heard these verses. I just want to walk through them really quickly. The scripture reads like this. And then Jesus came to them and said, All authority... In heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I will be with you always to the very end of the age. So this is interesting. In Matthew's gospel, if you had to write a gospel of what Jesus did in your three-year history with him, what would you write? Not only what would you write... How would you start? Probably at his birth. Yeah, I mean, he was born and he became part of our society. And then what would you write? Oh, well, he taught these things and he did these miracles. And here's the bigger question. How would you end your story? If any of you are writers or authors or teachers or you think about reading at all, you want to get to the end of the story because it's the major thing. It's the climax. It's the conclusion. It's the wrap up of the entire book. Do you know that these verses, Matthew 28, 18 through 20, are the entire purpose of Matthew's whole book? So Matthew is saying, if you get anything, get these words. These are the most important part of my entire book. Yes, Jesus was born and he taught these things and he did these miracles, but this is the point. The point is that Jesus calls us to partner with him. So if you're a journalist or if you've heard of these before, you know the five W's and an H? Well, what are they real quick? The five W's. Who, what, where, why. Exactly. And the H? How? That's right. What I want to do is just break down the scripture real quick into these five W's and an H. If you want to fill these in, it's really the scriptures. So you can find these later or just follow along on the screen. But uh, I'm going to skip the who part real quick because we're going we're gonna to jump to that in a second. But the what is, what is Jesus asking? He's saying make disciples. Simply our calling is to make disciples. You know what's funny about the church in our 2,000 year history is we've gotten so confused about those two words. We've gotten into concerts and writing books and having major speakers and having like this huge, let's turn the church into this huge mega complex, blah, 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 right? Jesus really said two things, make disciples. My question is, as a church, are we making disciples? Are we creating and teaching people to follow Jesus? That's our whole purpose as a church. What's the where, the when part? The when is, therefore, go. Jesus said, and, and this is sort of comes out of the Greek, it's not just, not just go make, it's as you are going, make disciples. It's the constantly, when is always, Make disciples everywhere you go. And, and what that means is teach people, share Jesus with people, talk to people about Jesus. What's the where? The where is of all nations. I did a little research this week. I looked up the word all. I think all means everything and everywhere and every person and every nation and every culture. And it doesn't leave anybody out. You know, there's a lot of weird culture going on with how North Korea is capturing Christians and not letting them have a church, right? And there's other places in Europe that are trying to close down the Gospels. And there's places in Africa that they're closing down the Gospels. There's all these places. But God says, go into all nations. Don't just sit here in your little town. Go to everywhere. But it also means be where people are and include God in a conversation. Here's the why. I like to always ask the why part. Why do we make disciples? Jesus said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. You know what that does for me? That takes me off the hook. I make disciples. Why? Because Jesus said so. Not because I feel like I've got this great ambition or this great desire. Or I have to. It's because Jesus said he's got all authority. How did he get the authority? He came to earth. He died for us, and not only that, he resurrected from the dead. So he has this authority from God. When God sent him to heaven, he didn't just say, okay, I'm going to send you alone to go on mission. But when you go and complete it, he says, I will 
I'll, I'll walk with you. And your completion of the mission gives you this authority as God over all of us. That's why we do this. And here's the how. It's really kind of simple. There's two ways to make disciples. One of them is to baptize people. And another way is to teach everything Jesus commanded. Teach everything Jesus commands. Kind of a lot. Jesus said a lot. But for a disciple to really know God, um, to be baptized is not about salvation, but it's about learning to commit and be a follower of Jesus, to commit to a church, commit to a community, to follow after what God calls us to. And to teach them everything I commanded you. You know, if you just stayed in the book of Matthew, in fact, if you just stayed in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, you could teach most of everything that Jesus commanded. It's beautiful what, what Jesus calls us to. And let me get to the who. Let me jump up to the who. This is part of scripture as well. In that verse, it says, surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. But how can Jesus be with us? Didn't he die and resurrect and go to heaven? What did he give us? The Holy Spirit. Do you know that today is the day called Pentecost? Have you heard of this before? This is uh, the 50th day from the Passover, which we celebrate as Easter. The Hebrews, the Jewish Israel people, would call it Passover feast. And 50 days after was a one-day celebration. In the Old Testament, it was a one-day celebration of kind of the barley uh, <laughs> harvest. It was this opportunity to celebrate with this feast. And it was Pentecost. Penta means five. And cost is like multiples of ten. So it's 50. It just means 50. Really. And so it's 50 days after the resurrection of Jesus. And so um, in the Old Testament, here's this cool picture. I always love to dig into what God actually did in the Old Testament. Do you remember when uh, the Jewish nation was captured by Egypt? And they were enslaved to Egypt for 400 years. Well, there was a thing called Passover. That's when the Holy Spirit came in to the town and it passed over the town. And anybody who didn't put blood from a lamb on their doorpost, would their life would be taken. But if you put blood in your doorpost, the Holy Spirit would pass over you and then you would be free to live your life. You would be saved. Well, then all of the Hebrew people were released from Egypt, this whole thing with Pharaoh and Moses and all that. And you saw the Prince of Egypt and all that stuff. Well, it's actually true in Scripture. And they go through the Red Sea and they're in this community in the desert for 40 years. And one of the first things God does is 50, year, 50 days after this, God sets up this a uh, pillar of cloud in the day. It wasn't, a hor it wasn't a horizontal cloud. It was a pillar cloud. And it was a pillar of fire at night. Do you know why? So people could follow God. God was walking around in the desert with them. And he would lead them. And they would go from place to place. And God would lead them. You know what's cool about uh, this Pentecost thing now? This idea that uh, the spirit of God, the fire of God goes with us in the Holy Spirit. In fact, Jesus said that. Um, surely I am with you always to the end of the age. So God is with us. He walks with us. He goes with us. His authority is what does evangelism. So we don't have to like puke out our theology and our faith on people. Some people are just disgusted when we just talk too much about God. But other people are, they're, they're kind of hungry. They're like, man, do you have a faith to, that makes you do that or act that certain way or... You know, do you actually have a faith? Because you certainly act different. Do you ever see some people that are a little bit different in the world? And they're, they're, they're acting in a way that's gracious, in a way that's kind, and they have some peace in their life that just gets hard, hard to explain. You know what I mean? That's because God's Spirit works with them. Here's a couple of things to let you off the hook, and then I've got a friend that wants to tell you a story. One thing to let you off the hook is, did you know that Jesus didn't convert everybody to Christianity? Did you know that? If you feel guilty, like you can't convert everybody, well, you're in good company, because Jesus couldn't either. Jesus tried, and he couldn't. People walked away. Did you know also that you're not responsible for the outcome of a person's faith? That's up to God. You can just simply be aware, and you can be available, and you can share your faith with people. In fact, that's what God calls us to, is to be available. He also says to be prepared. To give an answer. Anytime somebody would have a question about God, why do you go to a church in a movie theater? Why do you go to a church like this? Or why do you be part of this? Well, because, because I walk with God. I have this faith walk with God. And did you also know that everybody has a different job along the assembly line? 
The Apostle Paul said, some follow Paul, some follow Apollos, some follow this and that. And all of us have a different place where we can either share God or we can water the seed or we can plant a seed or we can harvest. My dad has this exceptional gift where he gets to often close the deal with somebody. He's telling me all the time, well, I prayed with this guy and he accepted Jesus. Oh, I prayed with this woman and she accepted Jesus and she asked God to come into her life. And I prayed with this guy and I said, how do you do that all the time? He goes, I don't know. God just sort of uses me and, and I'm not just loud about it. I just talk about Jesus a lot. It's probably how I got in love with it. I want to ask Dean to come up here and share a story about uh, he was um, doing some interim sort of executive pastor work in Texas. And he got to do some marriage counseling with this couple before they got married. And uh, there's this fantastic story that I want him to share. Here you go. I have to share a verse with you first uh, from uh, Thessalonians. It says, uh, uh, the one who called you is completely dependable. If he said he'll do it, he'll do it. And that's really the, the whole theme of what happened in this situation. I was uh, visiting with uh, a couple that were uh, supposed to be married uh, a month after I took over this assignment. So it was kind of a shock to me to try to get ready to handle their wedding. So we were uh, together uh, talking about all the arrangements. And uh, I was trying to get to know Greg. I knew Ginger, uh, but I didn't know Greg. I was visiting with him and it just seemed like he was kind of a little big in his life about uh, really uh, you know, walking with God and, and really seeing God at work in his life. And so I, before we left, I just wanted to, to give him something that would help him. And I had, uh, had one of these little booklets available there it's called the Four Spiritual Laws. But what it is, it's just a, a way that a person can get to know God personally. And I just thought, I told Greg, I said, Greg, I don't really know exactly where you're at. And uh, uh, there's something that it really helped me in my life and it's found in this little booklet and it just helps us to get to know God in our lives. So I said, why don't you take this and you can read it over. Okay, he said, that's that's fine. And so uh, things went along and the wedding uh, came about and, and we had a great time with that. And, and uh, then uh, a couple weeks later, uh, they showed back up at the church and, you know, they're newlyweds, but they were really beaming. <laughs> And I was just uh, kind of excited to find out what was going on. You know, I just wanted, it's good to see them and everything. Well, the story is that uh, somewhere in these uh, two weeks, uh, they were sitting down to have a meal together, and Ginger asked Greg if he would uh, lead in prayer for their meal. Well, Greg was kind of caught uh, without really knowing what to do, and he was kind of stammering around a little bit. And he suddenly remembered, oh yeah, there was a prayer in that booklet that Dean gave me. So he pulls out the booklet and he reads the prayer for their meal. And the prayer is how you invite Christ into your life. You know, you tell God that I'm, I'm really a sinner, I'm far away from you and I really need you and I want to invite you into my life. He prayed that prayer. And Ginger says, Greg, do you know what you just prayed? He said, well, yeah, I, I prayed to invite Jesus into my life. She said, well, did you really mean that? He said, yeah, yeah, I did. And they were telling me this story, <laughs> and it was just so awesome. You know, I was just so excited that, that here, Greg, because Ginger was so alert and ready, Greg made that decision. And it's just really a kind of an amazing thing because the whole process was just really of God and it points to that verse that God is going to do it. All I did was just, you know, give Greg a booklet and told him this might help him. And all of that came about. Well, the story doesn't end there. A couple months later, Greg came up to me after service. He said, uh, and he called me Pastor Dean. He said, I, I really had an amazing thing happen yesterday. I was at this... Uh, meeting where there's a whole bunch of men together and, and it was over in this church and we were kind of having this breakfast meeting and I got to talking with the guy next to me sitting there and he just had a bunch of problems and he was just going through all kinds of stuff and you know I just got to thinking, Greg's telling me this, that I should give him that booklet so he's coming to me and he says, you know you'll never believe Pastor Dean I gave the booklet away <laughs> isn't that awesome? 
just in such a simple, uh, very personal way, he was sharing Christ, who he had come to know a couple months earlier. Mm -hmm. I think that, that just shows that if God's in it, it's going to happen if we're just available and we just uh, ask God to use us. So that's what the story was all about. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. I believe it's true. I believe that God will use you if you're available to God. I had a conversation with somebody on Thursday and they said, you know, I just don't feel prepared. I don't feel like I know enough of the Bible. I don't feel like I know like these four spiritual laws, this, you know, this way of sharing my faith. I, I feel like if I get it wrong, I'll hurt the person or they'll walk away from God or I'll become a statistic where I've pushed that person away. Here's, here's the deal. I had a conversation with Dean about that. What kind of questions can you ask? What kind of ways can you share your faith that's not offensive? And he basically said, ask him one question. Ask him, how, how are you doing on your spiritual walk? What, where are you at in your spiritual faith? Where, where are you at? Have you, have you ever walked with God? And, and you can ask questions. And the more questions that you ask, the less offensive you feel. And the more people can just open up their heart and say, well, I don't know. I've never thought about that. I've never talked about God in that way. So, so this was all number three. That was kind of long, huh? On point number three of how to have a healthy, spiritual, missional thing. Here's number four, really quickly. Number four is transforming communities. I believe that if a church is supposed to be healthy, we're supposed to transform communities that are around us through compassion and mercy and justice. We transform other communities. And it, it's not transforming them like by making it happen, but it's by being involved. In fact, the scripture says in Micah chapter 6, verse 8, He has shown you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? Three things, to act justly, to love mercy and to walk humbly with God. Three things. And if our community can help other communities, and what we do is we act justly. We do the right thing. And we love mercy. We, uh, we love like God. We express a love to the world. And we walk humbly with God in that. We don't tower over people. We don't have to proclaim all this stuff. We just walk humbly with God. I saw this cute video I'm going to end our service with. Uh, it's basically on the idea of how to transform community just by simple acts of kindness. Watch this quick little video for a minute. My name is Greg Hagwood, and I'm the Plumas County Sheriff. I've been here with the Sheriff's Department for 26 years. Law enforcement is uh, serious work. We deal with serious issues. That looks very serious. Let's do this one right here. This blue suburban. I don't think we're going to be able to let that go. Let's light that up. Let's do this one right here. Good afternoon, Thank ladies. You. How are you? Good afternoon. I'm good. How are you today? Are you familiar with uh, Vehicle Code Section 339472? Yeah. No. No? How many people do we have on board? You and, and the dog. Okay. Can you just, just wait one moment? I'll be right back. We got reports that you're driving with that ice cream. Do you have ice cream on board? <laughs> no. You cannot drive with that ice cream. Ice cream. Ice cream, there you are. Are those real tears? Can I see your sunglasses off? Yeah, all right, good, good. <laughs> well, I didn't mean to make you cry. Hey, thanks a lot, guys. We appreciate it. And dog, stop being so serious. Got it? People need to lighten up a little bit. Absolutely. It's getting to be a real problem here. Oh, yeah, that's a serious one. Because uh, when you think about evangelism and you think about changing and transforming communities and you think about all the stuff, it can get really heavy, right? When really all we're called to do is to love other people, to love God, to share our love and life with others around us. So I'm going to pray this morning and uh, we will conclude. God, we give you praise. We thank you for the way that you do life and you do ministry with us and through us. 
God, you've called us to be salt and light in the world. You've called us to share our life with other people. You've called us to have a faith that is an expression of love and life to people. So I pray now this morning that you would equip us to do that. That you would, God, give us health and give us the ability to, to, to be healthy and missional and to intentionally share with others around us that we love. God, we love you and we ask that today your presence would be known. God, we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.